three, two. How's sound? Good. Okay. Great. Check in with you. Yeah. <laughs> hot. We're hot. So let's start. Um, Don't ask me who I am. I love 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 Born in Puerto Rico, raised in the Lower East Side section of Manhattan, it's a long time ago, but you still remember how and when you um, stepped into graffiti? Wow, well, you know, 1974, mm -hmm. the spring of 74, yeah. as a 14-year-old. Mm -hmm. But I stepped into the, the culture of, you know, subway graffiti way before that. Like in the early, early 70s, I was, I was watching it. It was, it was there. It was evident that something was going on behind the sheets and I was wondering, wow, what is that? What is this phenomenon that all this color and shape and form, letters, letters that didn't make sense, you know, that didn't spell themselves out, you know, necessarily mm -hmm. correctly. So how big was the graffiti movement back then in New York when you started? Well, the scene was huge. The, the scene was huge by 1972, 73, just before I got involved in it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know that there was a segue, there was a certain point of like getting introduced and being part of the, the group. Um, you know, like there, there was a formal way. It just happened by accident. Everything was by accident. So, and I, you know, the, uh, the process on how they painted w was something of, a, of an amazing, it was a huge phenomenon because everyone thought that You did it once, um, and that was that was just it. You did it once, and that was the statement, and that was the work. And for some reason, that that can multiply and make itself present everywhere was, you know, yeah. was, I, I, I guess my concept of it. Like, you know, you just go once and you do it, and your name is so shown and sewn throughout the fabric of New York. But it wasn't. It was that you had to do it constantly, over and over and over again. So, uh, yeah, 1974, 14, I, I, I woke up in that spring and, uh, you know, I saw my compadres in my neighborhood painting, painting their nicknames, and I went down and got messy, you know, and uh, from there on, the bug was on. You know, I, I had discovered myself that I needed to, this is where I needed to be. This was the audience. Mm -hmm. you know? So when you started, you had any... Masters back then? They were masters? Yeah, I mean, back then when you started graffiti. Yeah, I mean, you know, at that, it, it depends. There were masters on the street, there were masters on the subways, you know. Subways? You, subways was where you, 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 you ground your teeth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I remember some cat saying, you, you could write on the streets, you can paint on the streets, but no one's ever going to take notice. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the subways. That's the, that's the epic center. That's the, the, Theater of operations, as I call it, yeah. you know, and um, uh, so the masters that I remember <clears throat> discovering over a, a period of time, a short period of time, was was uh, Cliff 159, uh, Blade One, uh, you know, a number of uh, personalities that were painting um, uh, Tracy 168, uh, Chi Chi 133, the Wild Style Crew. Um, you know, the fantastic partners, you know, but they were all in their own little pockets of, you know, specialty, you know. Some guys were amazing composers of color and fantastic partners were really, um, really good at that. They were combined colors that were not the average, you know, sunny day, fair weather kind of, paint, you know, color coordination, they would, you know, they would, mix silver with a dark gray and then highlight it with a light blue. And it was just like conceptually, it was bizarre, but really, you know, inviting. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, at a very young age, as a teenager, I mean, 14, 15? I was 14. Yeah. At a very young age, you actually added a lot of like poetic and political messages and statements uh, to your pieces. 
for, for example, the Stop the Bump piece or uh, the Office Hell Heaven is Life, statements that I would not expect from a teenager. Uh, yeah. You know well, what I mean? You no, know, I mean, the painting, the, the act of painting was already a rebellious act. Mm -hmm. Okay. And applying it to a surface that was meant for something else, a municipal, you know, uh, surface was enough of a rebellious act to, to, to give you, it gave me the essence of like, wow, this is really my, this is my platform where I can really get to a lot of people, um, get the attention of many people. And at a very early age, I felt like there was an audience outside the audience of the graffiti Uh, movement itself, which was probably somewhere close, anywhere between 50 to 70,000 young people mm -hmm. painting at yeah. the same time simultaneously by the time I got involved in it. So mm -hmm. I just felt, well, this, this 70,000 young souls painting, but there's like four or five million at that time riding the subways. Um, and I think that they, they, they deserve, uh, uh, you know, at, at an early age, I just was like drawn to like having a bigger audience uh, than what you thought, you know, was, was, was worthy. You know, I just felt like, hey, you know, um, this is like film. I'm fascinated by film, uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, cinematography. And I always felt like going to the theater was a special event. And um, for that reason, I felt, Well, everything that's going on around me, you know, we're just two years after the Watergate scandal. You know, Vietnam is still kind of still going on. Um, uh, I'm going to Catholic school. I'm, you know, the ironies of that environment and, you know, the, the yin and yang of that. So there were a lot of questions in my head that I just felt like I just needed to address. And, I, and the weapon of choice was And the, and the place of choice was this, this venue of the subway, the, you know, uh, the, blood, the bloodline of the city, and a city that's very busy and maybe not even aware of its own existence and its own little faults. Uh, I just felt like this is where I can really come out. First, I have to establish myself uh, in a respectful manner, you know, like where people will look at my work respectfully, and then After that, I need to address what's really, per, you know, uh, boiling under the surface. And uh, so, you know, I've, I've always been a curious uh, kid. So, you know, politics and war and, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the offshoot of that stuff was always like, you know, I felt like this is, I have the weapon that I can really, I can bring a lot of attention to my name by talking not just about my name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after a while I felt like this is a little, a little bit narcissistic to just like continuously in a serial way, you're a serial painter of your name. So how many times are you going to identify yourself and actually feel good with yourself? And I understand that, but I felt, you know what? My name is just the, the signature But what's around it is central, you know. It's, uh, it's not the name that's the central character, it's really what's going, the conversation around the name. And I felt that the name would be more powerful in the, in the long term. Um, people will revert from thinking and looking at the name and experiencing the name and look at the work and then come back to the name when they, when they exit that, when that train exits the station. They'll be saying, oh yeah, that was the Lee car you know, or first come in as a Lee car expecting because people were saying, wow, Lee just does whole cars. Of course I do whole cars. It's a huge 50, 50 foot pallet. You know, I can, I can, you know, and in some cases 100 foot when you're doing two cars. Yeah. And a thousand or so when you're doing 10 cars. Mm. So. Um, you almost exclusively painted whole cars and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you are one of the major contributors to one of the Uh, first ever painted whole trains along with Doc and Mono and Slave. Um, talking about whole cars, uh, how much preparation and planning was in painting whole cars back then? Well, I think there was a lot of emotional preparation other than, than actual tactical, you know, uh, you know hands-on preparation. There was, there was um, mentally, there was a lot of, you know, going, coming, again, coming from a from a Catholic upbringing, um, you know, not that I was, you know, 
you know, seriously religious or anything, but that always hung on my shoulder. You know, I had this yin yang thing of the devil on one side and the angel on the other, and they both had great views. You know, I, I was always like, wow, you know, I have to go and appropriate this paint, first of all. So, you know, I, I'm thinking about numbers, you know, it takes me 30 to 40 cans to do a whole car. And I have to get those 30 or 40 cans before I even prepare to do any walking to the nearest yard, which were, you know, the nearest yard was 10, 15 miles away, you know, uh, or more. So, um, you know, prepping myself, like I have to go now and borrow this paint from a mom and pop store, come back with that guilt that I borrowed this paint and, um, and then get, compose all those colors to make a great visual statement and then also to make them be uh, integral to, to making that statement be strong. Um, to th there was a lot of levels, you know, layers that I had to peel off every night or every other night, um, con you know, continuously. And, you know, in some cases very different from the other, if I'm doing a double hole car or if I'm doing something, you know, more poppy and I'm just like being a little bit more, you know, festive with the work. You know, that's a whole, like, kind of like walk in the park. But, you know, when you're doing something that you know is politically charged, um, you start to think about the effects or the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the, uh, the rumble effects of what that's going to do to people watching your work and also what's going to happen if I get apprehended. And that was really, really frightening to me because I felt even before they told me I was the most wanted graffiti artist by the MTA for two years straight in the late 70s, I already knew I was dangerous by what I was doing. So I was already in danger um, literally just because of the effects of my work on the general public and the, and the writers, you know, the writers themselves. I think the writers took a back seat to it and they kind of like, it was kind of, it might have been to many of them, I could be wrong, but many of them might have taken it as like, oh, we have someone, the newsbreaker here. You know, I don't necessarily wanna be involved in that conversation. I wanna see a name, I wanna see style, I wanna see breakdown of the letter and rebuilding of that construction and deconstruction. So, you know, I, I, I understand that side of the story, but I think after a while they were like, well, this guy's not just some, you know, shot in the dark, fly by night guy, this guy is continuously trying to keep us aware of what we don't dare, you know, to talk about, you know, and, and um, so that was, you know, that, that emotionally, you know, building up to that and building up to like, I'm going now, now I'm, I feel like I'm at my invincible state, I'm determined, there's no turning back, DEFCON 5, you know, boom, we're going in, I'm going in and, uh, you know, it's kind of an emotional mindfuck, you know? Uh, so uh, I think that made me stronger than actually carrying 40, 50 cans of paint on each, you know, and being in total cognito, you know, incognito uh, dress code, you know, to, you know, look like I was gonna go and do somebody's garden, gardening or something, and then I turned into this ninja character. How, yeah. Yeah. How much of a media coverage you already had back then? There were no articles, uh, TV coverage, nothing. No, no, it was non-existent. There were other issues that the media was really, you know, there was little pockets. I mean, I did my first interview in 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget the name of the paper. It was a local paper, newspaper, uh, that kind of like, almost like in the Village Voice kind of tempo, but they, they did an interview. I gave them an interview. Um, kind of keeping it on the low key, on the low profile. I can't remember the name of the paper, but um, they, they, you know, on, on occasion, the general press, you know, the main press, New York Times, Post, uh, of course, the Post and the Daily News, you know, catering to like, you know, here's, you know, this vile act of vandalism, you know, whenever they had a slow moment in their days, like, they would give it some, 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 some attention, but usually in the negative side. And that bled over for years. And, you know, to this day, I try to re, you know, kind of detach myself from that, that whole mindset that like, oh, you young people are just there to, you know, destroy public property, 
Mm -hmm. um, you're against municipal, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, oh. you're just against municipality, you know, and you just don't want to, you don't want to pay attention. The fact is that young people change the world. Young people always want to change and flip the script. So, you know, why is it that you're not paying attention to 50 to 70,000 young people that are taking the initiative to go painting? We're going painting. We'd still be swimming in blood if we weren't painting. So the options, you know, we made our own options. So, you know, the city and the municipalities didn't give you any options. They said the street is there for you to destroy yourself. And it still is to, that, to this day. You know, go ahead. Here's the options. Gang life and, you know, all these other things that were very destructive. And here we came to become a movement um, global now. Like, like, like no other art movement ever in the existence of, uh, of mankind. An art movement by young people for young people of many ages, you know, of mm -hmm. all ages. You know, so you have this, this you know, w w we created ourselves. We, we, we reconstructed our lives through the name, in some cases an actual alias, which made you feel a little more you know, a little more full, a more uh, a sense of purpose, you know, because you're building this name, you're building these letters, and that's where the whole wild style concept, I get that, you know, but the fact is, is that we went out there religiously every night and day and made those conscious decisions to, to create something for ourselves and to create something that made us feel that we, were, we, we actually existed, that we were relevant in a very loud city. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about Wildstyle. Do you remember how you met Charlie, Charlie Ahern, the director of the movie? It's very vague. Charlie remembers it more than I do, but he met me very. Uh, <laughs> it was a very quick moment. Um, I was on my small scooter, mini bikes, as they're known for, that were very popular in the city back then. And uh, I had the flyest one. I still have it too, believe it or not. Parts of it are hanging up here in the. In the uh, um, it's probably one of the only things I ever bought too with cash, my money back then. But um, he met me in front of my handball wall. Um, he had been kind of loitering around my neighborhood, making short films and stuff. Uh, I think one of his first films, uh, Deadly Art of Survival, he had shot it entirely in my, in my actual project complex where I grew up. And um, He got this, you know, I guess he kept on hearing like, hey, you have to you have to meet this guy, Lee. I was already in the neighborhood, kind of like a mysterious character, but like very out there. My walls, my handball walls, the first of their kind, you know, were already there. So he was drawn to them. And I think he met me in front of one of the walls one day and said, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, filming you you know, capturing you. I was like, oh, there's the word that I don't want to hear. <laughs> I was like, I'll call you. <laughs> sure. You know, I sped off. Maybe, you know, a word to that, you know, that flavor. It was like, I want to capture you. I was like, no one's capturing me. Yeah. No one's filming me. No one's photographing me. No one's probably even interviewing me further at that time. So, you know, I was a little hesitant to, um, for quite some time to, um, get involved with Charlie and, and trust him and befriend him, and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so what makes you going forward with them at the end of the day? Well, it was a number of things that made me, uh, that, you know, nudge me on the shoulder to go forward with it. One was I had been talking, I had this idea of a film since 1977. Mm -hmm. And I pay tribute to that, believe it or not, to Elton John. Out of all people, why? I loved Elton John. I still do. I think he's one of the most amazing piano piano players on the planet, and among uh, among others. And I just felt like, wow, you know, I love his songs. I love these like you know these B cheesy songs. You know, don't let the sun go down on me. Someone saved my life tonight. And those things were always, you know, I was I was uh, I was playing those songs in my head and literally on my record, you know, my turntable to give me some kind of confidence when I went into the subways. Don't let the sun go down on me. Someone saved my life tonight, right? So, you know, um, I, you know, so 
I started thinking about like, wow, you know, again, because of my love of my cinematography and film, I'm a film buff, you know, from day one because of my mother. My mother was a film buff. And because of that, I was like, wow, to make a film about this life, you know, by that time, 77, 78, early 78, I'm like, wow, I'm really like coasting, but this is a lot of work. Yeah. And this is something that should be documented other than just a whole car on an Instamatic film. Mm -hmm. um, so I started talking about that idea with Fred, Fat Five Freddy by the time I met him in 78, late 78 at some point. And then Fred, also a film buff, and a little bit more well versed in film, film, you know, language and all. Kind of like the light bulb, you know, lit up. And at that time, simultaneously, he was already in talks with with Charlie. And they started talking. So I guess that talk bled over to like, hey, you know, we should have Lee be the star of this film, this this idea. Now I was a little hesitant because. One, I did not want to showcase how I was still operating in the field at that time. Um, I did not want to have my idea that I was thinking of get thrown in the mixer and turn into something else by someone else. So I was like, this is my baby. I want to do it. I want to make this film. Mm -hmm. So I had my ideas that I still got to this day. I have some, you know, and some are like, oh, God, I'm glad I didn't do that. You know, but then some are like, wow, that's still a great idea. And that's the essence of a great idea. It's always great even years later, right? So, you know, Charlie and Fred and I have discussions and I get involved in the film, you know, uh, to kind of protect what I really was doing. So I was very covert about what I was doing and I wasn't letting Charlie on to what I was doing, you know, he got a sense of it, but he really didn't know the real, true, no one knows to this day how I operated in the field. Um, I will let that out in my book, but or in a film someday, but I really never led on to like what I was doing. So I, I felt like, you know, Charlie was very, he was very uh, passionate and very um, sincere about the idea. So I was like, you know what, why not work with him? Also, Lady Pink was, me and Lady Pink were an item at that time. We were painting. Um, we had a lot of ideas about painting on canvas and livestock, you know. Um, and I was like, oh, she, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm 21 at that point, And she's like, I don't know, 17, 18. I was like, no one's going to kiss my girlfriend <laughs> on, on, you know, on film. I was like, it's going to be me, you know. And I, I think she felt the same way, too. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she might have felt uncomfortable. And she was talking to me about it uh, for some time, too, and might have also paved the way for me to, like, you know, get involved in the film. Mm -hmm. So what was the... Who was the uh, yeah target group? Um, you, uh, Fred, uh, and Charlie, and uh, the whole team made the movie for. Who was expected to watch the movie? Was it the the kids or? Well, Charlie and Fred at that point, you know, I mean, a lot of things are going on by this, you know, at this time, 1981 or so. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the punk scene downtown, the the alternative underground uh, film scene. Mm -hmm. The the above ground subway movement, you know, graffiti movement, street art, you know, everything is all poof, poof, all in the mixer, you know. So they had grand ideas of making a theatrical release. I also had ideas of that as well. I didn't know how to approach that and which way I can lead into that. But Charlie already had a great, you know, he had a great vision. I, I, this is my masterpiece, and it is. It's his cult classic masterpiece. And I'm sure that there's a lot left in Charlie still to this day, and Fred, yeah. you know, uh, as far as ideas and, and the look of film. And um, they were very excited to not only usher this new movement and, you know, into the limelight of film, but also like, this was their baby. This was like something that they were like so excited, you know, to compose the music for, along with Glenn, you know, I mean, with um, Chris Stein, You know, Glenn O'Brien is working on Downtown 81 with Jean-Michel Basquiat. You know, a number of things are all going on. So we're all racing to get the first feather in on the hat. So there's a lot of excitement and anxiety at the same time. 
So, you know, what better way to do it than theatrical? I mean, at that point, everyone's going to the films. There's none of this Netflix, you know, HBO thing going on where you could watch it on your screen. The screen was 40, 40 deuce, you know, the great theater row, you know, or theaters all over the city, all over the world, like where you can go. And it was a moment. It was a, it was a, it was a festive moment, uh, you know, a moment of, of integrity and a moment of um, pride and this celebration and also this like, this joyful inspiration when you went to see films. I mean, the Kung Fu films of the early 70s had guys starting fights outside the theater for no reason because they just wanted to fight, mm -hmm. you know? So, Should I go into radio silence for this now? Let's have a break. No, I'll, I'll stop. Then, then let's wait. Yeah. It's my, it's my, it's my, can, it's my phone. Oh, okay. I'll stop and boom, there it is. Unless they, they, they give a message. Um. So. You know what better way than to what better way than to uh, to showcase such a phenomenon, you know, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And you know, gotta admit, Wildstyle made it to the cut first. Yeah. And alongside of that, Style Wars, which was also going on simultaneously. Another reason why I didn't get involved too quick in both of them, and particularly Style Wars, um, Henry and Tony Silver wanted to feature me in place. Scene took that place, and Scene was a worthy guy as well. He was, he had an, uh, probably a rather interesting story, you know, and I think he had more charisma for the film than I would have mm. at that point, because I was just a little too secretive, mm. you know, um, where Scene was very open. And as we know, Star Wars, you know, he's one of the very pivotal moments in, you know, his introduction and the way his, mm. he, he brings it to the forefront. I wouldn't have been able to do that. I was just too like, nope, I can't do that. You know, and I was dictating a lot of things to Charlie uh, during shots, you know, and there were shots uh, in the yard. So I was like, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not going to be in the yard. I'm not going to show you how I operate in the yard. So I was a little bit, you know, difficult for Charlie. Charlie's got to get a <laughs> trophy just for being very patient. Mm -hmm. Or at the very, very least, you know, being very like optimistic, like, you know, I just got to, I just got to chew this bullet you know, with this difficult actor, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I gotta put this in the can, man, because I have people investing in me at this point, which was a German-based company. I forget the name of the company that threw money at the film, you know? It was very little money for that time, um, the bud for budget-wise, you know? But he operated, he put it in the can, um, you know, for that amount of money. So correct me if I'm wrong, but even before the movie was produced, you already had a show in in Rome, right? Yes. So before you started producing the yes. movie. So you and Fab Five Freddy went to Rome. In December, yeah. yeah. In 1979. And I believe it was one of the first graffiti art shows in Europe. That was very early. That first. That first, yeah. yeah. So how this show came together? Mm -hmm. And you already painted on canvas? I mean, regularly at that time? It was very frightening. I mean, I think that was more frightening than film to me because uh, You know, I was painting on stagnant, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm painting on canvas. I'm, I'm opening up, you know, I'm opening up the doors a little more wider. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can fantasize with film. You can do many things with film. You can edit it out. You can, you know, you can just manipulate it and make it whatever you want. But when you make a painting on canvas, you're opening up yourself to critique, um, censorship, all kinds of things that, um, that, that, artists of, that come from this type of background are not accustomed to, especially the young artists that were painting on subways, you know, where we were, you know, wild child flowers at that time, you know? So it was a, a bit intimidating for me to like all of a sudden be uh, showcasing my work and my message on canvas. And it was a little difficult to make that transition um, Because I, I still, even though I was afraid and intimidated by canvas, I still wanted to challenge it. And uh, I wanted to overtake it. Mm -hmm. and, and then end up in a comfortable place where I can, you know, work 
and feel good with what I have, you know. I still go through that difficulty to this day because I am creating work for, the, for a public that is very, very keen on everything they look at and, um, um, and everything they feel about a painting. So they, I have to feel it and see it before I even do it. And then when I execute that painting on canvas now, it becomes more of a, you know, it, be, it goes through an editing uh, process in the studio before it even leaves. The, you know, a lot of paintings get destroyed and I paint over them mm -hmm. because I don't think that they're right. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't want them. So yeah, in 1978, late 78, we're, we're prepping, uh, we're prepping for, for a show in Rome, Italy with uh, the La Mandusa Gallery. Mm -hmm. How did they find you? I mean, how they found out about you and Fred back then? Well, I, they found me through a string of uh, certain luck mm -hmm. uh, that came to fruition all at the same moment. Um, Fred comes up with this ingenious idea that we can create murals for a hungry public, public or private, we can create these murals um, at $5 a square foot. So. A photograph was taken of the Hamble Court that I created in 1978 and put in a small little ad in the Village Voice, small little clipping, like these rogue graffiti writers are now going legit. They call themselves, they go by the name of the Fabulous Five, which was a group that I was part of. Fred was not, but Fred appropriated the name and thought that he could push it to the next, next level, which he did, and it was great. And I'm glad that he did that because the rest of the Fab Five, except for myself, all kind of like fell into like a hiatus moment. They had run their gamut, you know, they had done, run their course and they weren't, you know, interested anymore in painting uh, as I was and as, as hungry as Fred was to see something come of it. Mm -hmm. So he replanted the seed of like, let's make this a legitimate art form and let's make paintings on walls not even thinking about canvas, but paintings on walls. Um, and I think we, we started getting some, you know, smaller commissions here. Here's this gentleman, Claudio Bruni and Tony Allen, both partners. Claudio, a very, very well off, health, you know, wealthy man, uh, living in all parts of the world. But when he comes to New York, travels on the subways. He's wondering for a year or so before he even sees this article in the Village Voice, who is this guy, Lee? By that time, the train line that I had been painting strategically was riding right underneath his feet. So he saw these trains. Everywhere else, he had white glove service. When he came to New York, he rode the subways. Maybe as a gay man, he loved the lure of the crowd and, you know, being able to be like, you know, amongst people that he can be like really close. You know, in the subways, you're close. You're rubbing, you're like, you know, it's like, so now he's, uh, you know, so I gather that was his drive or maybe he was just like, you know, this is the quickest way up and down town. And he was very well versed and involved in the arts. And uh, he picks up this article, again, maybe looking in the Village Voice in the back pages where there was a lot of services and, you know, for that community, which was great. And he sees this article and reaches out, says, I want to do a show. I have a gallery in Rome, Italy. I'd love to show you both. You're the fabulous five. Who are the other three guys? <laughs> you know, we kind of like, Fred and I kind of like put it together and re reformulate it to be like, we are the representatives of this group and we'd love to do the show. And hence, you know, we, we start painting uh, in, um, And by December of 1979, we're ready for a show. Um, and during that course of prepping for that show, we start sharing a, a studio, studio space uh, with this gentleman by the name of Stan Peskett. Uh, and the name of the studio was a sort of alternative performance space slash art, you know, painting studio called Canal Zone. Um, and I think that Canal Zone phrase might have been phrased by Michael Holman. It might be. I'm not sure. But it was called Canal Zone because it was on Canal Street, all the way dead at the bottom of Canal, right by the West Side Highway, when it was actually still there. And uh, that's where I met Jean-Michel Basquiat. So Jean-Michel Basquiat shared the studio with us, and we started painting together. 
Um, I was a kind of a little like nasty around the edges. I was like, don't use my paint. You know, don't, don't touch that canvas. You know, I was like very kind of manipulative and protective rather, you know, for lack of a better word of like my paint and you know, what I was doing. So, you know, I might've been a little, you know, a little, you know, not so nice with Jean, but Jean was creating his postcard paintings at that time. That's what he had. He was basically going from one sofa to the other, from one dish to another, and uh, ends up being like one of my most favorite, important contemporary artists to me, you know, like one of the most amazing artists, was straight to the gut, yeah. and because he had gut. And uh, I miss him. Mm -hmm. And I still go out to his grave and I curse him, <laughs> I curse out. You know, I, I continue our, our brash, you know, relationship that we had with each other. You know, but we, we painted together in that studio for a number of months. And, uh, and then those paintings made their way to Rome, Italy, where it was a huge party, huge opening, standing room only. I'm probably the only one in there, along with Fred with sneakers and a bomber jacket. Fred was a little bit sophisticated. <laughs> You know, he has a fedora hat or, you know, his long trench coat, kind of you know, <laughs> <laughs> mysterious looking. Um, so coming from New York City and the subway art movement origins, going to Rome, whereas I expect no graffiti at that time? There was none at all. Yeah. You know, there was maybe some scratchings on the walls, you know, political statements and stuff. I mean, you know, Pompeii. So 1979, Rome, Italy, no graffiti. I mean, the graffiti... We know there was there was nothing, not existent. Non -existent. Non -existent. I, as far as I know, me, Fred and I roamed the streets almost every night. We were so I don't I wouldn't even say it was a jet lag thing. We were so excited that we were in this 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 city, this historical city, ancient city, across the world. We couldn't fathom it. We were like, and we were walking literally around with a huge boombox <laughs> that we were both carrying. Yeah. Like he would carry it sometimes, and it was so it was huge that I would carry one end, he carry the other end. You know, when he got tired or when we both got tired, it's like you just grab the grab the end, man. And we were blasting this freaking music <laughs> through the streets of Rome, man. It's just like in the films, like people's lights were turning on, they were coming out of there. Like what? You know, these teenagers. You know, I you know I was 19 years old. Fred was 20, 21. You know, yeah, 21. And we're walking through the streets. And we didn't see any graffiti on the walls. We didn't see anything that showed that there was a, mo a momentum to it, a serial sense to it. Uh, and we came, and surprisingly enough, we didn't really tag the walls. A few tags made their way into places because we, we started using paint and making paintings there. Mm -hmm. But he was so excited. Claudio Bruni was so excited because he sold the show out in one night. The first evening, the whole show sold out. And all of a sudden, we were coming back with, you know, some real cash in our pockets, uh, Fred and I. And we were like, wow, we had a note here. We had a good note. And that's when it really got frightening for me. Because I was like, you mean we're not going to be, this is like the end of the whole subway era, you know, where I was very attached to. I was like, that can't happen. So that's why the trains went on for another four years with myself. Yeah. Uh, even when I went on with Barbara Gladstone, more established blue chip galleries, Barbara Farber, which is actually Barbara Farber and Jules Farber were, I believe, very instrumental to, um, and I could be wrong about this, but they were very instrumental in getting graffiti-based art to the rest of Europe. Yaki Kornblatt and Pinenberg and all those people were well aware of her gallery which at that time was called American Graffiti. And she was working with Mike Glear and Jenny Holzer, myself, I think Judy Rifka, you know, a number of like American artists that were doing things on the street. She was very, as early as 81, um, already like shoehorning, you know, putting her mark on the map of, of um, you know, street-based art, subway-based art on canvas. So Claudio Bruni, the groundbreaking And then, you know, subsequently to that, in 1980, we did a show in uh, Sa Paolo Sanyo Gallery in, in Milano, 1980, maybe about the same time, maybe the spring of the next year, like very quickly. And we sold that show out. And then we were back in New York prepping for our show 
at white columns. So, and you know, Fashion Motor's going on, Times Square show is going on, a number of things are like starting to percolate and you know, boil over to the point that it was un- inevitable that there was something going on underneath the streets, the fire down below, as they say. So yes, 1979 was a pivotal year where Fred and I brought the movement, or a hint of the movement at least, to the European, you know, theater, and basically, you know, shaking in our boots, at least for myself, uh, said, wow, we have found a whole new audience, a whole new purpose, Mm. and a whole new way of preserving the work. I mean, if this was the first ever graffiti art exhibition in Europe back then, um, would you say that that show had any kind of impact to other galleries or curators uh, doing more shows in Europe? Because I think that Yaki's shows had a direct effect or impact to the Amsterdam teenagers back then. But I believe was not the case in Rome when you did the show with Fred, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I believe that uh, the Medusa Gallery show you were part in had some kind of impact to the galleries. Of course, yeah. yeah. That now you have a momentum, you have a wave that's cresting, you know, and you have the sense that there is something jumping off in New York that is loud enough to be heard here on the shores of, you know, Normandy got invaded twice. <laughs> and, you know, and part of it was that it was the sound that New York was making. Now, Yaki and Pinenberg, being an a avid follower of the work and support of the work, and a number of other collectors in Europe um, were now um, looking at a cachet of artists. You know, a group of artists, you know, Dandy and Ramelzi and A1 and Futura. And, you know, Futura is also making waves with The Clash. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's things popping off every here and there. So a lot of light bulbs are everywhere and everyone gets a sense. We heard a little something and that was the Rome show. But now here's a, a huge contingent of artists, 10 deep or more. That are now sh- being, you know, it's like the Sidney Janis effect, where Sidney Janis picks up all these pop artists and modern, you know, and starts making ways where they were already doing shows before that, you know, and maybe small little private shows in collectors' homes, and only a few people heard of it. But now Yaki is at the right place at the right time. And then I'm working with Barbara Farber exclusively, along with Barbara, Far- Barbara Gladstone here in New York. Show sells out in Barbara Gladstone on 57th Street, which is, you know, you got to remember, there's no Soho, there's no Chelsea, there's no East Village art scene, you know, really getting off. The the art scene, the established art scene is 57th Street, Mm. you know, Madison Avenue. So, oh my God, there's a show going on there with Barbara Gladstone that's, she's just getting her feet wet. And so people are paying attention to that. Then the East... East Village scene is really starting to pop off with Fun Gallery and PPOW at thereafter and, you know, a number, you know, for some before East Gallery, a number of galleries are starting to st- start to turn on switches. So Europe is excited about this. So I think Europe hears Barbara Farber's footsteps and they see Patty Astor and Bill Selling's determination. So they start to say, we need to do something about this cohesively or independently. You know, we just need to get it going. And Yaki was right there. And he got great talents. Ramelzi and Dandi, may they rest in peace, are, 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 are close to my chest as the 10 best relevant artists. And, you know, that's why they're in this painting. You know, at least Ramelzi is, you know, close to my chest of this New York school that are very important that have that grew and even after the deaths have grown to become important artists because they were so ahead of their time that their work translates into any time zone. Yaki was very lucky to have these individuals as part of his roster of artists. Mm-hmm. Fichura is another one. You know, Lady Pink is another, you know, A1, unsung hero, A1, an amazing artist. Yeah. You know, on the same group, that little cluster of Melzi, Toxic, you know, uh, Core, A1, Jean-Michel Basquiat, that whole little cluster that was kind of like a little rebellious group that kind of like splintered off, but they were like doing their own thing. 
A1, um, unsung, undiscovered. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Yaki was there. And you know, a number of people here on the same, you know. But it's, but it, but it's still very interesting. Um, you going to Rome in such an early age, uh, in 79, and looking at Rome in the 90s or, or later, it really had that typical New York City <laughs> subway art look. Uh, from the golden yeah. era. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, come on, Rome. You know, the, the, there, there, there is so much history engraved and trenched in that country, that part of the world. You know, I mean, they know art. Mm -hmm. They get it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're going to be like, yeah, this is the new, this is the new language. This is the new conversation in the modern age. You know, and by young people that have a very keen, uninterrupted uh, view on the world. And the, the great thing about it is that it's very, it's very, it, 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 it's, 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 this particular movement is very, very, um, it's tethered to what's going on in the world. And I think art should have, it should have entertainment, but as well as entertainment, it should have some sense of, of urgency in the political climate, in the social climate, in the emotional climate, All of those things make for great art that lasts for years. And the Romans, the the, the Italian, the, the Italian peninsula, you know, that whole that boot, they got it. They they have their souls sewn, right? You know, so it was a beautiful country and city when I first went there, and it's still beautiful in its own way, in its crazy, chaotic way. But um I feel that it doesn't repeat itself. And it's on its own wheels, you know. So yeah, it does have its issues. There's highways that haven't been finished since 1979. <laughs> I've visited sites, construction sites, that are still ongoing. I'm like, you haven't finished putting that beam up? <laughs> that beam was on the ground yeah. 40 years ago. So you know, it's kind of like it's an ironic, you know. It's it's there's an irony to the to the laughter there. To the there's a sense of calm, you know, you know. Uh, Yet, you know, there's humor there mm -hmm. because um, they're they're so passionate people that they, it seems like things cannot get off the ground because they're so entrenched in something else, and they need to continue. They they need to continue like the conversation. Yeah, we're gonna get it done. Don't worry, but let's eat. <laughs> let's eat. Let's 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 yeah, feast. The, food, the Italian food. That's why I I love going there as well. <laughs> So that chosen uh, at Yaki Komplitz uh, Gallery in Amsterdam was also the time when uh, Wild Style and uh, Style Wars was produced more or less at the same time, right? Wild Style and Style Wars were both filming at the same time. They almost came, they almost were released like within a week or so of each other, right? if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. You know, Wild Style was released. Boom, a big splash. People are talking and buzzing about it all around. Style Wars gets released, a masterpiece. Tony Silver being a, a master uh, composer of, and, and along with Henry Chalfant, a, a composer of the moment, you know, sense of being, you know, feeling, music. It's theatrical, it's beautiful, it's jazz, it's jazz. Um, Within yeah, 1981, 82, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I think But uh, you were never part of Yaki's shows, right? I never had a show with Yaki. So you also were never part of his group shows. I never was in a group show with Yaki. Mm -hmm. I, I was not. I was kind of unaccessible, you know, at that point. You know, yeah. I think Yaki wanted to work with me. I was already involved with Barbara Gladstone, so uh, I think Barbara Gladstone was now steering the carriage. Mm -hmm. You know, she was putting me in important shows. I ended up in Documenta in Castle in 1983, along with Jean-Michel and Keith Haring and a number of other people, Jenny Holt. You know, so I already was in a good trajectory. Not that Yaki wasn't, but I think uh, I didn't want to be part of the gang again. Yeah. I was always like a loner in the subway, so why would I want to be a part of a group, a great group, have you, but, uh, but, but you know, I didn't want to be, I wanted them to have their own voice And I needed to have my own voice that needed its own maturing, you know, its own incubator to mature in its own way. Um, and I, hence, that's where I've arrived now as an artist. You know, people look at us as individuals, and that's great. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yaki might have been uh, wanting to, you know, and grinding his teeth to do a show. But, you know, Barbara Farber had that, that grip on that part of the world. 
Um, I wasn't working working with Claudio Bruni anymore. Not that we, you know, we just weren't, you know, he wasn't interested in doing any more shows. Um, I still don't know why, but, you know, Barbara Gladstone was already, she was ahead of the pack and, you know, we did great things together. Mm -hmm. So Wildstyle aired in uh, Germany, I think in 82, um, later, 83, 84, also Star Wars came, having a huge impact to German or European kids and teenagers. Um, did, did you actually recognize back then what Wild Style, the movie, did to the European kids and teenagers? I mean, five to ten years later, look at Paris or right. Amsterdam. You know, if you ask the kids today, their main goal was to copy and adapt what you guys invented in New York City back then. Um, they tried to make the city look like yeah, New York. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Well, looking like New York City is one thing, but feeling like New York City is a whole other. Yeah. Now, there is people that have, you know, urgent matters in their laps mm -hmm. in every city. You know, New York is not unique in that it's the epic center of, every, of humanity's feelings. It's just that it's very, you know, well covered here. You know, there's a big splash here. This is center stage to a huge conglomerate of other acts going on around the world. You know, it always comes here to get a little, like, a little pop to it. But um, I feel that uh, Europe had its own issues and the youth there. I mean, obviously, look, the history there, you know, the wars that have been fought there. There's a lot of bones, you know, uh, that are still buried there. And people are, you know, On, you know, they're, they're bringing that back up to the surface and a lot of it has to do, you know, reflects what's currently going on. Hence, you have a movement that is self-perpetuating, you know, something that is self-propelling um, always. And I think uh, the combination of Henry and Martha Cooper's book, Subway Art, along with Style Wars and Wild Style before that, it was unprecedented. I mean... Right there, like the perfect three-prong attack on the senses of the youth at that time. And then many people like Goldie in the UK, they didn't have a sense of anything was going on until they really saw that book and they could take it home and taste it and smell it and feel it. Like, this is real. This is legitimate now. This is printed matter now. This is a film can have a sense of, the, the beauty about film is that it makes you feel like you're on the seat of God because you're riding with someone, you're riding in motion, perpetual motion. But a book arrests everything, and gives you a time and place, whether it's in the toilet or, or at your, in your garden you know, table to read into something and digest it. And that's the beauty of those two things, you know, like film and printed matter came together. And the young, hungry people of those countries had, they were like, this is it. This is our moment to open up. And we don't necessarily need to mimic what's going on in New York. Uh, what happened in New York gave a sense of um, of what, um, inspiration in another country, another city, where it's like, yeah, we got this. If New York has it, we have our own story to tell. Mm -hmm. And I mean, because of that, I think when, when you shake the whole net of gold nuggets, you're going to get all the sand go through, you get those gold nuggets, and then you have a major art movement happening, and you have major, a, a, a major um, a vocabulary and visual uh, move, uh, uh, movement that comes to the forefront. And some of those people that are holding those Crowns now never even saw a subway. Weren't even born in 1979. So that's the beauty about this movement that it keeps on re reinventing itself with the help of the press. The negative press kind of gives it a little boot, yeah. quite honestly, because they keep on making it a relevant issue. And politicians make it a tangible thing that they can hang on to and say, look, I cleaned up the city. Mm -hmm. Vote for me again, you know, so those things come, they're always being mixed, but yet on the tail end of that, great artists come from it. So let them, let them keep on, you know, making it a, a negative, you know, having a negative undercurrent tone. But, you know, most people now are smart enough to say, uh, 
put a break on this. Yeah, there is conversation to be said, you know, to have about what's going on in the streets. You know, a lot of anger is on the streets. Man, there was some great art coming from the streets, you know. And the subways are not the main focal point anymore, but the street is, is, is happening and a lot of those things are transferring over to, you know, objects of beauty and, and, and mm -hmm. yeah. Today, almost 40 years later, do you feel proud about all that? I mean, being part of Wildstyle and uh, you had a huge impact on, to the young European graffiti movement. Do you feel proud about that? I don't regret anything that I knew was right all along. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to say, I forget from what song I got it from, just because things are good now doesn't mean they were wrong then. It just means no one was looking close enough. And you can't expect people to look at something when it's right there in their face exploding. You can't see an explosion from nearby, but you can see it from far and you can define it better. And you can tell the impact of it. So when you're 30 years away from something and you've had that much time and that much conversation after conversation and you have new people being thrown into the mix, whether it's new artists, new critics, new venues, museums and galleries, new collector bases, then you start to look at it more as a, wow, this, a, this is very elastic. This is a very elastic m movement that It's not just like some little, you know, little, little flash in the pan, some comet across the sky. This thing is burning. This thing is going across the whole galaxy. So I'm not in regret of all that because I feel that it, it gave a great, uh, it, ushered, it, it ushered so many voices into the, 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 the you know, the theater of operations, you know, it, it's so many young people can act, actually take this and grow with it, mature as artists, and know that they're here for a purpose, true art, the power of art. And the art, art is the most powerful weapon on earth. It really is. Mm -hmm. It goes across the senses. Empires fail, they come and they go, they fall, but what survives is the art. I've always said that. And the art is what we always look back to, to reflect on, or to actually get a little hint towards the future. So I regret that I wasn't as enthusiastic along with Charlie. I regret that I gave him a hard time, you know, but he loves me more than ever now. So I must have been the difficult, you know, the difficult guy that, you know, you always, you always fall in love with the person that gives you the hardest time. <laughs> and, you know, I love Charlie. I love Charlie. I, you know, Tony Silvers, I respect him. You know, Henry Chalfant, he's a saint. You know, Martha Cooper, she's, you know, She's the queen of all Englands, you know, to me. She's like, she's, she's on the highest pedestal. You know, people like that, and unsung heroes like, you know, Jack Stewart and people like that, that really, you know, behind the scenes, before anything was hyped up, were taking the initiative to go and document it with good equipment, with great, you know, camera and say, and, and, and making an effort to document it for historical reasons, but also to say, this now and, and, and then, And then, then is going to be important, and I'm, I, I need to, I need to take, I, I need to latch on to that, to that, to that, to that line. Yeah. So there's, you know, people like that. I mean, there, there's so many names that I can't remember now that, you know, documented uh, from all different perspectives, and that's great because it's so, so well rounded. It's not a flat. It's not the earth is not flat. Mm -hmm. yeah. One last question. I believe you recognize that there are still a few graffiti writers from back in the day still still active. Some are um, doing a kind of a comeback. Comebacks are always great. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Europe, Chins is still there, and there are a few people there who are still doing their thing. But you, as far as I know, stepped out of graffiti many years ago. You're not into graffiti anymore at all, right? You're not painting classic graffiti it's, anymore, it's, right? It's, it's not that I don't want to do it anymore. It, it has changed its temperament. Mm -hmm. The temperature is different, too. The climate is different. Yeah. New York is different to me now, you know? Uh, times are crazy, but things were great back in the day, right? 
you know, people talk about the buck wild New York. Yeah, it was great. I had a great time, but I also was a very frightened individual. I'm frightened for other things in the world now. You know, I'm frightened for my children. I'm frightened for the legacy of, uh, of, of many countries. I don't want God to just bless America. I want God, if there's anything, to bless the world. So am I in an incubator? In a, in a, in a, you know, am I in a, in a conversation over cigars at a bar with some of my compadres? No, I'm in a bigger conversation right now. And I feel that what I did then was for that time. And I was in that kind of mindset. It was that type of climate, political and all. Um, now it's a different climate that I feel the work can, can exist, can, 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 can supersede me. It could, it could go beyond my lifetime and touch people, uh, you know, so doing it on the street is a little, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's really a firm more, you know, it just, it comes, it comes and goes. It's kind of always being changed and that's good. It was refreshing, but I don't need to look over my shoulders. I don't want to look over my shoulders. I want to look over, I want to look over hindsight. I want to look over, you know, Theor theoretical limitations that people put on. I want to look over that and look at what's on the other side of that fence. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to look over. Yeah. So I want to chase new dreams. I want to chase new initiatives, new, new urgencies. You know, I don't want to get chased by cops. I've already proven that. They've already proven their side. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to do that. But, you know, is that the entry level for most young people? People these days, that's what they choose, and that's what they do. And that maybe keeps it, you know, kind of refreshed in some way. You know, there's a lot of it that I feel that is kind of vile and violent. You know, there's, you know, this is a, this is a collective. And I think young people, as a, as a message to young people, young people need to know the power that they possess with the weapons they have. So, you know... If the, if the fight chooses you, choose the weapon that you can fight with. And that weapon, if it's in the streets, then it is, but make it relevant. Yeah. Make it that it has purpose, that it has pilings, you know, it has pillars where it could stand for its, it stand its own ground in argument and in history, during the course of history. So, yeah. I get a little, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. I don't know whether oh. <laughs> Lee, thank you very much for your time. Hey, you got that sound? Of course. <laughs> Is it working? Are you sure? Oh, uh, We will all fine. be pissed off at you. <laughs> 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 Refitty, 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 refitty.